Welcome everyone to IQ Metrics' uh, Interesting People, Interesting Stories. I'm very excited today that we have Pete Anderson with us. His mother has described him as one of America's business leaders. Very exciting. Uh, he is uh, self-defined as dashingly handsome. I'll leave that up to you to decide and charming uh, to a fault, no less. So uh, this will be very interesting to see uh, Pete put on his charms as he uh, talks with us today. We're gonna focus on leadership among many other things. Uh, he is practicing uh, self distance or uh, social distancing because he usually has an entourage with him that will be playing Beethoven's Ode to Joy in the background. Uh, so you can see Pete does not have an entourage today. So very responsible in how he is uh, fulfilling what we need in these times of uh, uh, coronavirus. So welcome, Pete. I miss the entourage. It's so cool to have an entourage doing Beethoven's Ninth. I love the idea that you have uh, uh, interesting people, interesting stories, like right away, just sticking it to your guests. Like, okay, live up to this. <laughs> Should be super easy. Amazing background. Uh, one of your areas of interest, though, Pete, is leadership. And mm -hmm. really want to talk to you today about leadership, especially in uh, the current times where uh, COVID-19 uh, has hit peak, maybe in some parts of the world, uh, where we are in North America is getting close to maybe the peak but is putting a lot of pressure on businesses, governments, nonprofits, uh, education. Uh, I'm curious, from your perspective, as you look at leadership, what is needed from leaders at this time when we've got so much uncertainty? We're in a unique place. This hasn't happened in 100 years to have this kind of a global pandemic. And what's different is our communication tools are different. Our technology is, is different. Uh, and this is not going to be the last time uh, that something like this happens in an increasingly globally interconnected world. You can see how fast the coronavirus has swept around the globe. It's person to person contact, but it did not take long to go from one small area to every corner of the globe. So then how do we, how do you, if everyone is in their, in their basements or on their couches and their homes and you know, some people going to work, how do then do you exercise leadership? Leadership is still uh, necessary and required. Uh, and for my purposes, I, I, I try to, uh, John Cotter with uh, um, Harvard Business School separates uh, leadership and management, where he says that they are, are, he describes them as basically two sides of the same coin, but that they're distinctly different, where leadership is about vision, leadership is about change, management is about complexity, putting things together. And so we have these two challenges of how do you manage organizations and structures when you're held at a distance from them? And then how do you lead? How do you exercise change? Now, from uh, government and health agencies, uh, both local and national and federal, you can, you can see leadership exercised, uh, both good and bad. But the, the economy still has to go. Uh, organizations, nonprofits, for-profits, companies still have to be able to operate. And how do we do that? How do we uh, exercise that leadership to continue to drive change? We can just sit at home and wait and see what happens. Uh, but there is opportunity to keep things moving and keep accomplishing things. But that requires leadership. Tell me then, I, that's, that's, I, I agree with you that leadership is more important now as any other time. And I do believe that the elements of leadership that we need to exercise in particular, the ability for empathy or being able to communicate vision, for example, um, or even finding ways to kind of model the behaviors that you want uh, from your teams and others. How do you do that when we're just Zooming all the time? How do you make that real? I think one of the tools that's helpful is uh, uh, to use Daniel Goldman's model. Uh, Daniel Goldman is famous for coming up with the idea of emotional intelligence. Uh, he basically said in, in studying business leaders, uh, they noticed that uh, business leaders who were particularly successful were not necessarily the smartest ones, that there was a, there was a sh threshold level of intelligence that they had to, uh, to have to achieve. Uh, they had to be intelligent enough. But past that, uh, they weren't necessarily more successful. And what made them successful is the idea of emotional intelligence, being able to connect to and lead people. And you, you mentioned empathy. Uh, that is one of the, the elements of it. That, Daniel Goleman divided those up and it's easy for people to look these up. Emotional intelligence is, is all over the internet. Uh, but he has self-regulation and self-awareness. So uh, knowing who you are and being able to control your own emotions. 
you sense combine those into self-management. Uh, then there's social skill, getting along with others. There's motivation, which is personal. And there's empathy, being able to understand others. And empathy is uh, particularly difficult over a webcam, mm -hmm. uh, but also particularly important. Uh, knowing where people are right now with coronavirus, that some people are, are deeply scared. Um, others unconcerned, uh, some others just cautious. Um, and people are still trying to, uh, still trying to do their jobs if they can. They're trying to create some value. Uh, it's all the more important in a economic shutdown like this that anyone who can produce some value does so. If we can keep money moving through the economy, that that has, uh, that has carryover effects, cascading effects. Uh, anytime you spend a dollar, that dollar goes through a lot of different people and keeps things moving on. So if we can have that empathy for what people are going through um, and then use that model and, and think through the rest of it, uh, uh, you know, who am I? Am I good at this kind of technology? Am I good at this kind of communication? Do I, do I operate well on a, on a webcam or over the phone? Um, if I do, great. If I don't, how can I improve that? Uh, Self-regulation, are, are my own fears getting the best of me? Um, am I able to uh, demonstrate my true self over a webcam? It's much more difficult. Uh, right now I'm talking to you and I'm, I'm looking into a, an unblinking computerized eye. I'm not looking at a, at a person. Mm -hmm. um, but if I can imagine you, if I can think about you there, I can, I can hopefully convey the emotions that I feel. Uh, that social skill, being able to uh, talk to people face to face is easier. We're used to that. Being talked to people over a webcam is a different skill. Um, uh, the motivation to do it, wanting to do it, it is easy in a time of fear to just try to pull ourselves up with our family and not do anything and just wait for it to end. And maybe we shouldn't do that. And then have, are we able to understand what people are going through, what they're feeling? So I recommend people look at that. Look at Daniel Goldman's model. Look it up. Don't just listen to me here, but Look it up and just read through it. it find, I find that it is particularly helpful in the current environment to uh, try to identify where our strengths are in emotional intelligence and then try to find ways to improve on those areas where we're not so strong. Uh, so for our listeners, as we usually do, we'll make sure we'll have links up around this podcast so that you can uh, look up on emotional intelligence. One of the things I hear you saying when you're describing all those pieces is that the net result is the ability to connect. And the importance of a leader to be able to connect with, with your teams or, or, or broader groups. Who in your opinion right now is exemplifying effective leadership and is able to connect with their audience or, or with the people who are looking to them for, for guidance during this time? One of the people that is, has uh, been in the news a lot in the United States is Governor Cuomo in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has been, uh, he's been very influential on this. New York is being slammed by the coronavirus. And uh, Governor Cuomo, for his fans and for his critics, has been lauded for the job that he's doing. He's basically doing kind of a, a fireside chat. He's, um, uh, he's getting in front of the camera and he's just talking to the populace. He's talking to his citizens and talking through what's going on, giving lots of information. He realizes, as, as we all should, that when, when things are uh, dicey like they are now, when things seem a little dangerous, people are craving information. They want to know what's going on. And Governor Cuomo is offering that information and he's offering perspective and he's offering uh, recommendations. Uh, he seems to know where his expertise ends and he brings other experts in. That, that has seemed to have helped. Um, uh, one of the late night comedians, uh, John Oliver, said that uh, Governor Cuomo is someone who irritates him very deeply. But even he has found that he has been a, a soothing influence. And he looks forward to the pandemic being over so he can go back to being irritated by him. It's that kind of idea that what Governor Cuomo seems to be doing is setting aside most of the, the political interests and ramifications and simply trying to connect with people, saying that he understands, saying that he gets it. Uh, and trying to, to have that connection. Uh, his brother, Chris Cuomo, who's um, uh, on CNN, uh, is now infected with COVID-19. And that is one more thing that uh, Governor Cuomo can talk about to, to say this is, this is something that he has it in his own family, that he can think about that. And 
people can relate to that, relate to the fear that he must have, the concern that he must have, um, but also see that he's, he's pushing on. Uh, he, I think, is a particularly good example. Um, governors tend to be a little um, less partisan in the United States, so people don't respond the same way. Uh, if you talk about Donald Trump, people have very strong reactions one way or another uh, based on their, their, their own preconceived ideas. Uh, with Governor Cuomo, there's, there's less of that. Um, uh, as a governor, he's able to, to speak in a way that uh, can appeal to everybody, and he does. One, I, I like the example you chose. I, I strongly agree with you. The, one of the things that has struck me with Cuomo in this time is his ability to convey authenticity. That he, you get a sense of him as a person, uh, that he allows some emotion to come into his briefings. He allows people to get a, a, an understanding of what is important to him and what he values. What is he doing specifically that helps that come forward that others could emulate? Well, I think one of the contrasts you can have to kind of understand what Andrew Cuomo is doing is, is to compare him to uh, Bill Blasio, to Bill de Blasio, sorry, the uh, mayor of New York. Uh, mm -hmm. New York City is so massive that uh, New York is the only state in the country where the uh, a mayor tends to rival the governor when it comes to power and influence. Uh, very often, uh, people aren't so concerned about who the governor of New York is. They're, they're really looking at the mayor of New York City. And this is where the biggest crisis is. And uh, Bill de Blasio, who is an experienced, dedicated public servant, who uh, doesn't seem to be able to make that same connection that Andrew Cuomo does, doesn't seem to be able to get information out in the same way, to be able to soothe people, to be able to connect with people. So what's the, what's the difference there? What is it about, about Andrew Cuomo that has made that connection and has made him something that people all over the country want to, to watch and, and listen to? And I think... This is hard, and this is where he gets to a lot of opinions, and people can dice it their own way. Mm -hmm. But I think what Andrew Cuomo has simply managed to do is uh, demonstrate that he's not very self-conscious. Uh, he makes dumb jokes. Uh, he, he's speaking off the cuff. Uh, he'll make dumb comments, and he'll just keep moving. It feels like a normal conversation. He doesn't feel polished. He doesn't feel like he's coming across with a prepared presentation. He feels like he's just processing the information as he gets it and giving the information out. I think that people in leadership positions can be so concerned with doing it right that it can come across as too polished and even maybe a little fake. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Cuomo doesn't seem to be doing that. He doesn't seem to be trying so hard to be professional. He seems to be just being himself and just trying to be personal with all the quirks and flaws that that comes up with. It makes him believable. It makes him relatable. Uh, how do you relate to the governor of a large state? Uh, most people, that's nowhere near, you know, their level of, a, their, their realm of experience, rather. Um, uh, but for Andrew Cuomo, it seems to do that. It seems to make it feel like, like he understands what you're living through and you can understand what he's living through. Um, that is a unique accomplishment. Bill de Blasio has not been able to do that. Andrew Cuomo has really made that connection. One of the things that, that as you were talking about that, the, it, it seems to me that one has to not only have, and you mentioned this earlier about self-awareness, but there also has to be a degree of confidence, a level of comfort in your own skin that you're not worried about, you know, making a mistake in a very public forum. You're, you're more concerned about being able to communicate and connect rather than, so, so for some, that confidence level where they do want to have everything so polished usually reflects a desire to avoid making a mistake. Where can people go to to develop a level of confidence that they're okay with the mistakes or the flubs or the misspoken or the poor jokes where they're not feeling so self-conscious but they're actually able to just allow themselves to be themselves? Where, is that, where can you get that confidence? Boy, if I could answer that question, I'd start a training company and make a gazillion dollars. Like, how do, how do, you, how do you train confidence? And, and I think it's just from getting out there and, and making mistakes and just, do, you know, just getting out there and trying, just doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, we do, especially in the United States, we tend to mistake 
megalomania for confidence. Uh, this idea that if you're confident that you you think very highly of yourself and and don't think you have any faults, and that's that's not confidence. That's that's insecurity. Uh, we have a very orange example of that in the United States right now of that kind of insecurity that gets mistaken for confidence. Confidence it is. Confidence is being able to, to make those mistakes or make those flubs or make those flaws and let those show and let that be part of the overall persona. Uh, confident people know their failures. They know their, their drawbacks. They know the things that they aren't good at. Uh, they know their abilities. Um, that is true confidence. And I think that in the long term, that kind of confidence is, the, is what uh, develops trust, is what causes people to really trust and work with somebody closely. Mm -hmm. I think some people kind of have a natural confidence, uh, but to say that you're born with it, I think a lot of that is developed. Um, you can talk to anyone in any field uh, who's really good at their field, and they can describe all the mistakes and all the failures and all the times that they've flubbed up. Um, and there's been plenty of those. Um, uh, some even... Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was you know, one of the more inspirational people in life, when he started off, he felt that he was kind of a wooden, stiff, and uninspiring speaker. But he kept doing it and learned to speak better and in a more inspiring way. Um, I think it's helpful to know that even the best in the world had times that they weren't the best in the world, and they, they whatever it is. Uh, but they kept trying and kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. Um, even if the it's the oldest thing in the book, practice makes perfect, or you fall down and you just got to keep getting back up. But it is so true. If you can just keep doing something, you will get better at it. Some people have natural talents in certain areas, but whatever you do, you keep doing it, you'll get better. I think confidence comes from that. Yeah, uh, I strongly agree with you. The, the importance of, of practice, I mean, where does confidence come from? How do you know you can make a three-point shot or if you can hit a certain note on the trombone, uh, it can only seem to come from practice. So confidence, I think you're absolutely right, is taking that first step and practice. The Toastmasters is built upon this, that how you get effective at public speaking. Well, you're going to public speak a lot. So what may, then makes me wonder, how do, you, how do you encourage someone to take the first step, that risk of, okay, I want to build either leadership skills or I want to uh, try something. How do you get someone to really realize that you have the power to actually take that first step? Well, this is what's so tough, isn't it? I mean, this is what's hard is how do you, uh, how do you try that new thing? How do you, you risk that failure? There, and we all know people like this. There's some people that are so good at experiencing a failure and they brush it off and say, well, okay, I learned from that and they keep going. And where I think most of us tend to dwell on those, you know, that failure hits, whatever it is, it's a small embarrassment to a bigger failure, and we just can't let it go. And there's a lot to be said for learning from that failure and moving on, uh, because the, the dwelling on it, the holding on to regret, doesn't do anyone any good. And maybe that comes first. Maybe it's that, that self-awareness and that self-regulation of knowing and accepting that that failure is there, that you, you, you're going you're gonna to have times that you fall, uh, and being able to put those aside. If you can do that, if you can just think, well, it's not really all that bad, then you don't mind jumping out for the next failure. Um, I personally have done a lot of public speaking, and I've had a lot of times where it did not go well. Um, and those times I, I, I was able to after a time, put those aside and brush my hands off and say, okay, learn from that and keep going. But interestingly enough, I still remember them very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've learned my lesson, but I haven't been able to let go of them completely. So how do you get the courage to take that, that first step? I, I think that there is some comfort in knowing that the worst that can happen really isn't all that bad. Um, I think the other thing that can help is to read about how others have developed those skills and to see that they have gone through those failures too. Um, uh, I particularly like those kind of uh, autobiographies or even biographies that people write about uh, uh, quite famous and successful people 
and find that in their past, um, there were a lot of failures there. It gives them real confidence, um, knowing that if they failed and kept going, well, then we all fail and we keep going. Um, there's a real danger and regret holding on to those. Yeah. I, I don't know the secret to getting past that, but again, I think maybe practice is the, is the key. I think it was Churchill, wasn't it, who said success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. That sounds like him. Uh, something to that effect. I've probably yeah. butchered Churchill's yeah. quote, but right. uh, I'll be forgiven by someone somewhere. Right. The, and well, quite, quite famously, another example of uh, Abraham Lincoln quite famously failed at uh, most of the things he attempted before he became president. Uh, yeah. in, uh, he was not a very successful man until he was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Henry Ford is another one of those. Failure after failure after failure, and then finally success. So there are those as well. That does not mean that we all have to resign ourselves to that. We don't mm -hmm. have to go from failure to failure to massive failure. That's not the only way to, to succeed, to take those kind of risks. But I think it's helpful to know that, that uh, even the greatest people have experienced a lot of failure and moved on. If they can do that, then we can experience small failures. We can experience small setbacks, uh, even small embarrassments dust off and just keep moving. How do you, uh, you personally keep your enthusiasm up to try new things, take on difficult tasks? I, I know you do the Ironman uh, on a regular basis. How do you keep that level of enthusiasm up for huge challenges? Triathlon was one of the things that uh, uh, resulted from a, a way of thinking of trying new things. Um, I, I read somewhere that uh, people oh, what is it? People learn things for the first 20 years of their life, and then for the rest of their life, they just keep doing those things. And I, I, that's an oversimplification, but I think there's some truth to that. You know, you, people kind of pick a sport early, or they pick an activity early, or an interest early, and then that's what they do. Uh, they tend not to pick up uh, big things. Now, there's plenty of exceptions to that, and lots of people listening to this were like, well, wait a minute, I haven't done that. But I, 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 when I read that, I was in my 30s, and I started thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe this is, maybe this is me too. And I started thinking, what kind of things could I, could I pick up? Could I do that's new? Um, I was a skier, and I really enjoyed skiing. And so I uh, acquired a snowboard and took a snowboard lesson and found out that I liked that too. It was a very painful process learning to snowboard in my 30s. I don't recommend it, but I got better and, and enjoyed it. Um, and then uh, triathlon, I had a friend who was... Um, uh, heavily involved in triathlon and she got me interested and I was uh, very close to 40 at that time and wanted to give that a shot. I did a, I did a small race and loved it, you know, just swim, bike, run. And I did a longer race and I did a longer race. And eventually I thought, well, I could try this Ironman thing, which seems, seems ridiculous. Uh, it turns out there's lots of very normal people who are doing it. Um, <coughs> I saw an event before uh, you know, I was able to watch some on, on TV and, and see what that is. And along with the people that are super athletes, there's lots of just really normal people. And I think that gave me that confidence, again, seeing other people who had gone through some failures and been able to do it. And I was interested in trying something new. It really inspired me to just try new things. And so I try to do that. But sometimes I find I have to force myself a little bit. You know, I go to a restaurant and instead of ordering my favorite dish, I order something I've never had before, something even as small as that. And I think it becomes a habit where I try to look for change. I try to look for that thing that's new. I try to look for that new activity or thing that I can keep on. I don't want to be flighty just going from one thing to the other. I want to be able to devote myself to certain things. I've certainly devoted myself to triathlon and enjoyed that. But how can I, how can I take on um, a, a new challenge and how will that help me expand who I am? Um, that has helped me. Um, and that's I'm just speaking from my own perspective. I'm always hesitant to the idea that whatever is good for me is good for everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that for a while I did, after my first few tri triathlons, I thought the whole world should do this. Everyone should do this. And I got all my friends to do a triathlon and um, th they all did one. And most of them said that was great and never did it again. <laughs> and that taught me a lot about individual differences and individual interests. Uh, I have my interests, other people have theirs. The, the point was just trying new things. And I think that really is the thing that is important. How did, how did that, I'd like to learn more about this, that you, because you instilled the mindset that uh, enabled, enabled you to have a willingness to try. 
And mm-hmm. so there had to be something that kind of got you to that point. And so what was, what was the process that you got there to realize, I'm going to try something different in this restaurant as opposed to, which is a small thing, but at the same time, it's kind of like, well, there's a risk to that. So how, yeah. did, you get, how did you get to that, that stage? What was the process that got you there? Well, for me, I had a lot of help in that I have a, a background in that. I was uh, part of organizations that had a lot of change, logistically heavy organizations. I lived on the road quite a bit, requires a lot of flexibility. Uh, and so that always helped. But what I found is that I was, it, as I was, you know, getting to be 40 years old, uh, a, a time in my life when is not marked by, by great change, I was no longer in those organizations. I was no longer being pushed by the external uh, to change. I wasn't living in a new city or moving to a new place or taking on a new job or a new project. Uh, My life had stabilized quite a bit. And from then I had to find a new internal motivation to seek out change. And that's when I, you know, picked up the snowboard and uh, tried a triathlon and uh, took a course to be a, 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 a triathlon race director to see if I would like that and, you know, did a little work in that just trying to see what kind of new things I could find. But it's an active search. Uh, But it was in response to finding myself in a different place, a more stable place in my life and realizing to myself that I could just sit here quite happily and do just what I'm doing now. Um, But where can I find continued growth? Um, there's 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 an old idea, and I think it's so true, that you you don't learn when you're comfortable. Um, as one of my old mentors said, you, you don't learn anything lying on the beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, lying on the beach is a lot of fun, but you don't, you don't learn anything. Uh, you learn when you're uncomfortable. You learn when you push yourself. Um, uh, a, a former Navy SEAL, I don't remember his name, said, uh, do something every day that sucks. That's how you grow. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, the idea of chasing physical comfort or chasing uh, personal and emotional comfort uh, doesn't push us outside of our boundaries. And if we do grow, I think we find greater satisfaction there. doesn't mean we have to avoid comfort. Um, but I think at times we'll be able to push ourselves outside of it and just try new things. Um, so at about that same time, I uh, you know later looking at other things and I took a, a scuba course. I've always wanted to learn to scuba dive. And I did it, I went through the entire certification and I got my certification. I've never been scuba diving since. It was fun and it was great, but it didn't really appeal to me. But I'm glad I went through that. I'm glad I went through that course. Uh, it, the, the difficulty of learning that new skill was valuable to me. The fact that I then abandoned it and did other things it is not the point. It's that I tried something new. Um, I, I think it's just, I think it's so easy to just sit down and stop pushing ourselves. I think we all, I think we all feel that impulse. And then it just requires a, a desire for that greater satisfaction that comes from growth to take that next dangerous step, take the risk and try something new. But, uh, one of the things I heard in there that uh, seemed very important to me is that not only did, were you asking yourself some tough questions, uh, the self-reflection in response to those, uh, those questions, uh, what am I gonna do now? How am I gonna grow? Um, do I, do I just want to sit here and be comfortable or will I push myself? The ability to ask the questions is one thing. The ability to answer the questions honestly is the second thing. And then the third seemed to me is what I heard you say is that the ability to act on what I know the answers are. And, and so this is all intrinsically motivated, it seems to me, but you also brought in another element where you mentioned others doing something inspired you. And it didn't even have to, by the sounds of be a famous person. It was just seeing someone do something was inspirational to you. So I, I, I think, you know, that's what I really heard you saying about the asking the questions, being able to, to really answer them honestly, act on them and look for inspiration is mostly intrinsic. When you think about the importance of intrinsic motivation within leadership, how do you tie that together where in leadership, you can't necessarily, you can get some people to do some things when you want. But generally, effective leadership is tapping into the intrinsic motivation that people already have. How do you tie that into kind of your perspective on leadership and even within your own life? How do you, how do you see those pieces going together? 
I think this gets back to that emotional intelligence. You have that personal motivation. You want other people to tap into their personal motivation. You have to empathize with what that motivation is. You have to use your social skill then to, to engage and draw that out. And generally, people want to be validated. Generally, you know, they want to know that they're important, that they're mm -hmm. a part of something. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the classes that I do, I, I compare uh, two presentations done by, one is done by uh, Tony Robbins, the uh, motivational speaker, and the other one is by Mike Rowe, who uh, famously did Dirty Jobs and uh, Most Dangerous Catch, uh, those kind of things. And he's working Dirty Jobs, I think was particularly interesting. And they have these two different perspectives where Tony Robbins says that you, you pursue your passion. He says, find out what your passion is and pursue that. And if you're going to be good at something, then you have to do something that you're willing to, to put in those long hours and to never give up. And so find out what you're passionate about and pursue it. And Mike Rowe gives the opposite advice. He says, don't, don't follow your passion. It, bring your passion with you. It, you can look where everybody's going and you might decide to go the opposite way, but find that opportunity and then bring your passion. And of course, both of these people are right. Uh, both of those perspectives, even though they are mutually exclusive, are correct. If you do pursue your passion, you are very likely to work very hard at it. Um, but you know, if your passion is surfing, you're probably not gonna make a, a living at it. Um, so maybe that becomes a hobby. Um, but if you can bring your passion with you, if you can find passion in what you're doing, then you can succeed wherever you go. I think leaders are often able to draw that out. Um, we've all seen that in some you know, high functioning teams, really well developed teams, where they find that way of, of motivating each other, motivating uh, one another. And I think that they find um, it is that, that respect they have for each other. It is that connection they have with each other, that social skill, that sense that they are in it together, that they are working on something together, and that what they're working on is important. I think that is really bringing their passion with them. Mm. I, that, I love that perspective. And, and I started thinking about for a lot of people listening who might say, yeah, that sounds great, but I'm not really passionate about anything. And I've never really been a passionate person. I'm not, it's not really there. Uh, so that's great. Love that, Pete. Thank you. But yeah, but it know, may not be. It, I think it's worth remembering. It may not be important that you're not passionate about your job. Mm -hmm. Find the passion of the people around you. Find the passion of the people that you help for the value that you bring. Uh, yeah. I think those can be the things that really. I think. It, I think it can be a a life changing concept. Um, uh, every job brings value in some way. Um, and there's some really rough jobs to do. Mm -hmm. You look in our current situation in the, in the pandemic and who are the heroes of this whole situation? We have the healthcare workers on one side, we have the doctors, the nurses, the medical assistants, the people working in hospitals and clinics. They are the clear heroes of our age helping people. But you also have the people that are providing essential services. You have the clerks in grocery stores who are restocking shelves. Uh, there is a heroism there. They are in a building that is visited by thousands and thousands of people. They are having to be near other people. Social distancing is very difficult if you're having to work in a grocery store. If you're a clerk and you're having to check out everyone's groceries, every single item that that person has touched, and then every single item that the next person has touched. So here we are in a position where grocery clerks, where people working at, uh, uh, at the stores that we need are, are some of the heroes of our age, people who are taking a personal risk in order to help us feed our families and keep society moving. Yeah. There's a passion there. You don't have to be passionate about checking people out at the grocery aisle, but you can be passionate about the importance of the role that you're doing and what you are providing for other people. I think if you can bring that passion to you, I think it provides a real sense of purpose. Uh, who would ever thought, grocery clerks, they're, they're some of the heroes of our time. And, and what, I, what I see within that is identifying the importance and the value of what you're doing. And that can be for others and it can be just for yourself as well. If we, you know, I completely agree with you. I, you know, the people who, if, if, uh, if we're ordering dinner, the, the, the individuals that are bringing us deliveries to our homes and the, in the grocery stores, 
uh, generally not thought of in the sense of the heroic efforts that they're undertaking, but in this time we can see it. We can also transfer that understanding of the difference something makes, not just to uh, challenging times, but within the day to day, if, if there's ever going to be such a normal again, what the new normal will be, there's gonna be opportunities to identify what's important and being able to just be participating within that. And that can be self-identified doesn't have to be what somebody else de designs. But here you're saying is that we have a lot of control and choice over the things that we do and we can see how we can connect with it. We can see how it can make a difference for others, but equally important, the difference it can make for ourselves. I think that's one of the fascinating things that we have with this pandemic is what happens after this? Does society go back just the way it was? Or do we, do we learn something from this? Mm -hmm. Clearly that's gonna be different individual to individual, but there are lessons to be learned here and lessons that we can leverage. Uh, things that may make us more effective as a society. Understanding those things that are really important. I suspect that at least for a while, people are going to be more appreciative of healthcare workers, are going to be more appreciative of the people who are working at grocery stores and people who do deliveries. I, I think that those things will be more appreciated. Hopefully that will last longer. I do think that some people will re-examine their own life goals of what they're doing and what they're accomplishing. Um, uh, this is certainly a time when people are, their career, many people, their careers have stopped and they're home with their families and they're facing a real threat to their family. I think that can be, people reevaluate what is important and that balance between work and family. And then when they go back to work, working for their family, I think, Sometimes uh, uh, the difference between success and failure is just a mindset. And that happens with leadership too. Uh, I think that effective leaders are often able to connect people to that mindset, to that goal. It's that vision that you're, you're, not, you're not just, last night we got a pizza delivery. And I could say that the guy who brought it just brought pizza to our door. But it's pizza that we really like and we like as a family and we had a movie night together and the pizza is a part of it and my two young sons really enjoy it. And that was brought to our door by a restaurant that we can't go to. The job that he did, the experience that we had as a family was facilitated by a, a delivery person. Um, and I think, he, I think he knew that because I know the business, I know him. Um, I think connecting to that mindset of knowing what you're about can really help. Uh, I, I love that. I, uh, just one or two questions that I want to ask before we wrap up here, Pete. One is, you mentioned there are things to be learned during this time. What have you learned so far? What's the biggest thing that comes to mind for you? Well, I, kind of, I touched on one before. I, um, like many people, I worry a little bit about my career and where it's going and, and am I accomplishing what I want to and... Uh, uh, <laughs> In this particular environment, it, my family is the most important thing. That shouldn't be a large epiphany. That shouldn't be a huge thing to think about. Uh, that shouldn't be a surprise to me. But of course, my family is the most important thing. Um, I have a four-year-old son. I have a one-year-old son. My wife is a nurse, and she works in our local hospital. Uh, we are quite aware that she walks into a building every day where there are COVID-19 patients, and she has not yet, but it will likely work with those patients. We are likely to be exposed. Uh, and we know that, yet we're immensely proud of her for the work that she does. I am living with a true hero. And when I consider the work that she's doing and how I'm able to support her, uh, working from home, helping to pay for our lives, helping to care for our kids, uh, it is this little team of people, this little group of four, um, that we are what is important to us and then we can take that importance and, and my wife can do a real service to the community. I, I, that shouldn't be a surprise to me. I always knew my family was important to me, but the biggest thing I've learned is just how essential and how fundamental that is. Biggest thing I've learned and I won't lose it from here. I think that is uh, a lesson that all of us, uh, I can tap into. I, um, I, I love what you said there. And it, it reminded me of how many uh, Zoom calls in my family were very close, uh, our kids. And, and we 
are constantly in connection with each other, even though it's, it's, it's over video now. And that reminder of the importance of family and that, that connection. Uh, Pete, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us. Loved what you had to offer and the insights that you provided. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to talking with you again. Well, right about now, Ode to Joy should be playing for my entourage, but they're not here. So that's okay. I'm going to go play with a couple little kids upstairs and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. But thank you for this. I appreciate the questions. And hopefully, hopefully for some people out there, I've been an interesting person with interesting stories. For the ones who weren't so interested, sorry, I did my best. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. You have a great day. Thanks. That's a wrap.